This is a talk about perimetry principles, sort of the underpinnings of what we do with perimetry. There are separate talks that go over how to interpret an automated visual field. That's a very long talk. And then there's yet another talk on the visual field changes that one sees in glaucoma. This is a relatively shorter talk, just going over the principles of perimetry. The visual field is widest temporally, and there's less visual field above, nasally, and below because of, mostly because of structures of the face, like the nose, that block the visual field. But the field is widest temporally. And if you think about the field like an island division surrounded by a sea of darkness, it actually is a helpful way to imagine what perimetry is trying to do. So we have this island, and, and the point of the island, the peak, uh, is the fovea. That's where your vision is the most sensitive, and then it drops off rather quickly until you get to the far periphery when it disappears after you run out of retina. In here is a blind spot where the optic nerve has no overlying retina, and you could consider that like a well in the island that goes all the way through. So you can characterize the topography of the island in two major ways. One way is to slice the island at different elevations. So here's our island of vision, and we've looked at how big the island is at different elevations and drawn how big that island is. So this is the blind spot going through, and you can see that at sea level it's this size, and as we get closer and closer to the fovea, it gets smaller and smaller. So these rings at different elevations are called isopters, and they characterize the shape of this island quite nicely. This test kind of testing is generally done manually, although it can be done by automated perimetry. And typically is what we do with a Goldman perimeter. So people talk about Goldman perimetry. It's really not accurate. It's, it's manual kinetic perimetry, meaning it's done by hand and the target is moving. You can do static perimetry on a Goldman, but nobody does. Um, so manual kinetic perimetry targets are brought in until they're seen by the patient and different size and intensity targets will map higher and higher, lower and lower on this island, and we'll show that in more detail. So this is a Goldman perimeter. Patient's chin goes right here. He or she is looking at that fixation target straight ahead. The bowl is diffusely illuminated at 31.5 apostilbes. And then the technician is uh, here with the right index finger is turning on the light and moving the target until the patient responds. By looking through the telescope, the perimetrist can assess uh, fixation and, and uh, attention of the patient. And then you can see that uh, moving this pantograph and then manually marking the, the paper here to denote where the patient was seeing the target. This is the back, so this is what the perimetrist is moving, then that corresponds with the light moving inside the bowl. And you can see that this is mapping out this visual field. This shows a controller on the back of the Goldman machine that, where one can choose the size and intensity of the light, and it's vastly variable. The thing that's adjusted most is the size, so usually the light is kept maximally bright and just the size is varied. And you can see that going from zero to five, every step is multiplied by four. So all you really have to do is remember that size two is one square millimeter and then multiply each of those by four to figure out what everything else is. I've never seen zero used uh, we usually use one, three, and five at our institution, but obviously any of these are available. 
So 5, 4E, that's the brightest. Size 5 target, 3, 4E, again the brightest light. Much smaller target, and then the 1, 4E is what we typically do at our institution. And then if the patient has very good vision, rather than going to the, the smaller target, we would go to a dimmer light, and that's so 1, 2E. So the 2 uh, refers to the brightness in five decibel steps, and the, and the lowercase letter is a one decibel step of attenuation. Manual kinetic perimetry is typically done with the armley drance technique. And so the armley drance technique uh, is not a lot different than most forms of manual perimetry, except that it concentrates on the nasal horizontal because of the uh, horizontal raffe and the tendency of glaucomatous defects to show up nasally more so than elsewhere in the field. And it also does super threshold testing within the central 20 degrees, meaning that they take a target that's visible out here, such as this target, and go in and test throughout this area to make sure that there are no scotomata in that area. So this is what a printout would look like using the, unfortunately I don't think the color schemes are standard. Uh, this is some with good vision, so we didn't even look at the 3, 4E or 5, 4E because they would be off the page. This is a 1, 4E, uh, 1, 3E, and a 1, 2E um, isopters. This is a patient with glaucoma with a dense arcuate scotoma that just splitting through fixation and also a nasal step out here. You can see that again the 1, 4E and 1, 2E look pretty full just like that normal field out temporally but nasally there's this big dent in the field and so the perimeterists use the 5, 4E, the brightest biggest target to characterize that. Manual kinetic perimetry is very much an art form and so it takes years to become a great perimetrist um, and, and unfortunately it's a dying art form. These OKs refer to the fact that supra threshold testing was done here so the using the 1, 2E target the perimetrist tested inside this area to make sure that uh, they weren't missing a scotoma in there and use the blue, the 1,4E, to test in this area to make sure that there was not another scotoma. This is a nasal step. You can see how it runs along the horizontal meridian for more than uh, 10 degrees or two isopters more than 5 degrees. Um, and this is a very dense scotoma, so the fact that it's purple means that it was the 5, 4E target, the biggest, brightest target, was not seen in this area. This is blue, meaning that the 5, 4E target was seen, but not the 1, 4E. Well, the other way to map this island is to measure the thickness of the island at a prescribed grid of points. And so this is again our island, and we take this pattern, overlay it over the island, and measure how thick the island is at all these different points, and then color that with the color of grayscale. So here's the blind spot corresponding to this, and the higher the area, the lighter the gray. You can see these numbers are higher centrally and they fall off in the periphery. So this is static threshold perimetry, means that the target is not moving but it's still. Um, and it's measuring the threshold of a point. Uh, this has changed a little bit with strategies like CETA that speed up the process. Um, so that I'm not entirely sure what happens in a CETA field, but in the full threshold fields, which were unfortunately quite slow, the light would be brighter and brighter and brighter until it crossed the threshold, and then you would go back down in smaller steps until you crossed it again. And you wouldn't stay at one point. You would 
present a bright target here and then go off and do other things and come back with a dimmer target. Otherwise, the patient would fixate on that point and you would actually have summation of those targets. So it's a very smart machine, uh, the way that it does this test. So this is what, what happens in the Humphrey and the octopus and other static threshold perimeters. So they're basically trying to find the intensity of light that's seen half of the time. And that's the threshold. And it's measured in decibels of attenuation of the light. So the light is 10,000 apostilbes. And at this point here that has a 31, that means that the light is attenuated by 31 decibels and is still seen half of the time. One decibel is about a tenth of a log unit. The light is presented for less than half a second. If it's presented for a longer stimulus time, then that can lead to summation and it really uh, invalidates the results. Most automated static threshold perimetry is a white target on a white background called achromatic perimetry or standard automated perimetry. A real advantage is that there's a standardized examination strategy. So if I did a field in Iowa City and somebody else did it in Helsinki, it would be exactly the same task. It eliminates the perimeter's variability from field to field, and it takes much, much less skill to do than a, than a manual kinetic perimetry. Sadly, it can't eliminate the patient variability. So this is a Humphrey perimeter. I think for glaucoma, I would recommend that static threshold perimetry, white on white, is the preferred technique. Goldman, if available, it can be used if the patient's unable to do automated fields. People have very advanced disease, but you can also try using a bigger target or a smaller testing area on an automated perimeter. Or very old or very young patients sometimes do better with manual kinetic perimetry because there's a human rather than a computer interface. There's some automated alternatives, short wavelength automated perimetry or swap, which uses a blue target on a yellow background. It isolates short wavelength cones. And in theory is sensitive to earlier damage. But it may not be better than achromatic fields, than white on white. And, and real frankly, I don't use it um, almost ever. I, I have one patient I've been following with SWAP for years, but I almost never use it, partly because I tend to see people with pretty advanced disease. Frequency doubling perimetry presents alternating light and dark bars that alternate in a way that makes it seem that there are twice as many bands that are actually present. In theory, selects for the M cells and may be sensitive to earlier damage. There is a screening version that is very fast. It just tests a few points in each quadrant. Uh, and then there's a version called the Matrix 24-2 on the Humphrey that uses the same pattern as a CETA 24-2. But again, I'm not impressed that this has really changed the way that we do perimetry clinically very much. And there, there are supra threshold uh, perimetry tests. And, and I think of this like a pass fail test. So the perimeter presents a target brighter than what the patient should be able to see. And if the patient sees it, then that point is done, considered to be normal, and moves on. And this is really a type of strategy that would be used for screening, but not for following someone with glaucoma. I think a really important point is that it's better to stick with one kind of a test and do it more frequently than to move back and forth between different sorts of tests. So it's better to do 
a CETA 24-2 every six months to a year rather than alternating between a CETA and a matrix and a swap because it'll take a lot longer to see a change if you do it that way. So whatever you do, try to stick with one strategy. A little bit about the physics. So the background luminance of the bowl is 31.5 apostilbes, which means that the test is done in the photopic range as opposed to the scotopic or mesopic range. The maximum brightness on the Goldman uh, is a, a thousand apostilbes. On the Humphrey, it's brighter at 10,000. And then in automated perimetry, as we already said, the sensitivity is measured in decibels of attenuation. So if you can turn the light down by 3.4 log units, or 34 decibels, that's a point that's much more sensitive than one where you turn it down by only 15 decibels. So the higher the number, the more sensitive the point. If you want to calculate how big the defect is, remember that the bowl is about a third of a meter, 333 millimeters, and the eye is about 17 millimeters from the nodal point, and so that's about a 20 to 1 ratio. So the size of a scotoma in the bowl is roughly 20 times what it is in the retina. So this talk is just kind of an overview of the difference between kinetic and static fields. There will be separate talks on how to interpret an automated threshold field, and then another talk on the type of visual field changes that we see in glaucoma. Unfortunately, we won't talk a lot about manual kinetic perimetry beyond this brief introduction because it is sadly a dying art. I will have examples of kinetic fields when we talk about glaucomatous visual fields, but we really won't go th through the technique very much at all.